Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Bioshock Infinite. Looks like we're taking a trip back to familiar territory. Booker, look. You're on the First Lady. So that is actively her dress. The First Lady Mark II was built around a particle lift system just like all the buildings in the city. I read all about it in the Columbian Scientific. The particle seated at the top of the structure must be up that lift. Perfect. Seems like a lot of technology just to float an airship. Comstock never heard of hydrogen. The First Lady Mark I did run on hydrogen, and it was destroyed by a single bullet from a Vox sniper. Unfortunately, the Prophet wasn't on board at the time. Did Comstock never hear of helium, then? Still, it is kind of nice that we finally get to see inside the airbag of one of these ships. If I take the active particle, then the First Lady is just a 40-ton paperweight. Best to take the spare. Here we go. Now let's head back through that tear. You honestly expect Atlas to honor his side of the deal? No, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. How do you plan on handling Atlas? He ain't just some spliced-up maniac. He'll make a mistake. I just have to be ready to take advantage of it when it happens. All for a girl you barely know. How well did you know me when you came to Columbia? Pretty lady not finished yet. What? Open the tear. Power for devices, very expensive. Need for that? Just tell me what you want. Such a want is something as simple. Lock of hair. Oh, you're not serious. Not in your hair, stupid! Fink has a secret lab. Mothballed, forgotten. In there, hair sample. In jar. Cannot miss it. You get for Sutra. Then, everybody friends. Where is his lab? Closed off past Fink's quarters. And you smart lady, you find. Should have seen that one coming. We must have arrived right in the middle of the siege. That means the other you and I are probably inside the factory. On our way up to the First Lady. And what happens if we run into ourselves? We won't. How do you know that? Because we didn't. Press to generate a bullet snatching shield that places ammo into your gun. You know, just because you didn't, doesn't mean that you can't. I mean, that's that's not how this works. I mean, future Elizabeth changed the course of history, supposedly. I mean, she didn't really, because this is a multiverse model. But even so, she did change the course of events. And so could this Elizabeth. There's really nothing stopping her. Yeah, you might think that that uh, waving banner flag is unnecessary, but uh, no, it, it kind of is. I kind of had trouble finding it. I've taken your counsel, and you've done me good service, but I will not hurt the boy. I will see Fink and Comstock burn, but I will not hold the son to account for the deeds of his father. You've misunderstood us. We neither asked you to harm the child. Nor did we promise that yours would be the hand that would set Comstock's world afire. A famous man once said... And a famous man shall say... I may reach the mountaintop. But I fear I shall never visit the valley below. But you mean I won't live to see the... No. It's up to you what matters more. Your part in the play. Or the play itself. Someone is coming. She'll arrive, a girl. She must leave. 
a woman. And what makes the difference between a girl and a woman? Blood. Your part in the play. Or the play itself. Turn her into a killer? How? Give the girl no choice. And she will be forced to make one. So yeah, that's a retcon. That is very obviously a retcon. People bringing up an issue of uh, why these things happened, and now here's your explanation. It's because the uh, the Tesses were actively manipulating events to cause them to happen that way. Yeah, those of you who thought that uh, Daisy really would have killed the child, oh, uh, screw you, because apparently she wouldn't have. And those of you wondering, Takes care of that. But, uh, let's see. What else was I saying? Oh, yeah, so the Lutesses intentionally let thousands of people die, intentionally allowed this rebellion to take place. Although they didn't allow this rebellion to take place because this rebellion always took place, because this is a multiverse model where everything happens. All in order to engineer an in a single moment in which Elizabeth would be forced to murder someone in order to protect the life of someone else. Presumably so that she would have the, let's say, cojones to, um, to murder Booker in order to get rid of Comstock. Because that series of, event of events also made perfect sense in a multiversal model. Also, what's the deal with Booker always asking the stupid questions in order to give the exposition to the player? I mean, that, that, that worked when he was alive, and he really was, you know, ignorant of these things. But in this case, he isn't actually Booker. He's the part of Elizabeth that still remembers what's behind all the doors. Well, now come to think of it, what's wrong with just seeing behind all the doors making her a woman? I mean, she, in that moment, would see an endless amount of tragedy and harm and disgusting things happening. That's what it means to see infinity in an infinite universe, seeing all of the despair, feeling all of the times you died. They're doing a bit of redemption for the Vox Populi here, too. What with them, uh, you know, doing stuff like not murdering all of the rich people and um, not necessarily looting everything in sight, although it's 
fairly clear from the contents of the Zeppelin that they're also doing that. What's the price you're willing to pay so that others may live free from the yoke? The wit knew the price and paid it willingly. No sense what the Lutest twins will one day ask of me. So far, their council has served me well. Served the revolution well. If a bullet takes me, so be it. But to offer myself up as a lamb? When I come to my Garden of Gethsemane, will I play my role willingly? Or will I burn the place down to the roots? Nothing in that safe, unfortunately. Apparently they can hear me over that engine. <laughs> and apparently they know that it's a she sneaking around, even though they've never seen Elizabeth. <laughs> but they aren't particularly unique in that. Alright, but I did see something on the inside here, so, you know. Change. That's what the people need. But sometimes I feel all I have to offer them is blood and fire. The things they've done to me, I can't forget them. I was Columbia's victim, and victimhood begets shame. Oh, what element of human experience is more corrosive than shame? I'm rotted from the inside out. What do I have to offer this revolution except my own dark motivations? When all is said and done, what's more important to me? The people I want to save? Or those I want to murder in their beds? Damn it! Luckily, there's this escape right over here. It looks like it was entirely unnecessary anyway. Alright then. Here I come. Now, I always get a little turned around in this area. Not quite sure where I need to go from here. I mean, I already explored all of the optional areas around here, so it's a matter of just, you know, walking in the right direction. Well, since I've these guys to deal with already. What is that? Alright, he's turned around now. Conk him in the noggin. And then finally use the navigation button, which I have neglected to use pretty much throughout the entire game up to up until this point. Like, did you guys know that that existed? I just never really had to, because I've played this game before. And there's usually only one actual way to go. So the only real use is to, you know, discover which of the two ways is the real way to go. Yeah, there's a war coming. You can smell it in the air. Fear. Hatred. People dying every day. But how many more will suffer if we rise up? Violence begets violence, I know this. I've seen this. 
a rational mind argues for a peaceful solution to find a common ground, but what common ground is there to find for a father who watches his child bleed out in the street? How do you deny him his vengeance? I know that fire that burns deep inside. I know it all too well. And when the time comes, will I be able to stay to hand? Also interesting note, but apparently both Rapture Coins and Columbia Coins are entirely interchangeable. So that's a convenient constant between universes. Anyway, we haven't been here before, have we? Looks like the mechanism unlocks certain activities when Fink gives his blessing. So what? We're stuck waiting for the cuckoo to go off? No, there's a... there's a slot for some kind of key for manual winding. We just gotta find that. Sure seems like a lot of work to lock down a few doors. Yo, know, if there's one thing Fink loves, it's a lot of work. Mostly in other people, though. This is where he sleeps. In a room full of camera feeds. We've got the clock key. And a statue of himself on an end table. And a whole bunch of phones. I mean, like a whole bunch of phones. current state of being, or lack thereof, has left my brother unfulfilled. The biological urge to leave one's mark is strong, and it is not an impossibility. We could instantiate ourselves back in Columbia, return to an old life for the possibility of creating new. But we died in that world. Returning would mean giving up part of us. Ourselves. We'd become flesh and all that it is heir to. The mysteries of the universe would become once again... Mysteries. So how can they exist at all in this universe if they're not allowed to? completely exist in this universe. Like, I, I can... Like, even with that explanation, I can't quite wrap my head around the mechanics of this. And, okay. Apparently the guy loves his absinthe. And apparently this revolution has been going long enough for the, uh... For the prayer door to have opened in the past so that revolutionaries could have gotten in here to deface all of the uh, holy statues. I mean, it's nice commentary and all that, but uh, wh where the hell are they now? Where is everybody now? And his version of leisure involves a bottle of wine. Sea slugs. Goddamn sea slugs. Could that Oriental have come up with a more inconvenient fuel for his plasmids? If there is a god, and I've seen more evidence to the contrary than in support, you'd think he'd have put Adam into the belly of a nice little seagull or crow. The cost of all these underwater expeditions are murdering my margins. 
Apparently doing research is also part of his leisure time. As is housing confiscated goods? From Vox? What is this doing here? As to the matter of religion, let me place myself in the camp of the agnostic. I pretend to understand the mysteries of the infinite no more than you, Comstock, or anyone else for that matter. But for the sake of argument, let's say this is all one unhappy accident, and we're all alone in our toils. Then who would Comstock use to control and shame us with rules that apply only to those with not a penny in their pocket? If there were no God, you could rest assured the first deed done by the first rich man would be inventing him. Well, if you ask some people, they would say that the American dream acts the same way. Giving people a false sense of hope that uh, hard work will be rewarded no matter your skill level or your ability to uh, connect idiot his lock of hair with the currently wealthy and powerful listen I got you your gun I'm here for my ass but my book of the wind died for the fuck popular you either an imposter or a ghost. My book of the wit was a hero to the cause. A story to tell your children. You. Just don't resist the Look, are you there? I miss you. You're the only one who ever... You're my only friend. Even here, I'm a projection of your own. Could you humor me then? Please. I think Booker would miss you. Yeah, but you killed him. So he's not very capable of missing anybody. I mean, aside from the versions that still have Anna, in which case they definitely don't miss you because they already have their daughter. And that daughter isn't you, for some reason. Because even though he reverted back to a version of himself that could exist, without this whole paradoxical nonsense, Elizabeth herself is not so lucky. What's going on? So yeah, that's kind of weird in its own way. Another one of those rules I got questions about. Anyway, we do have a turret in the back there. And also that person standing right in front of it. Which is why I decided to just, you know, go straight for the knockout. Because while I can make, the make sure that turret is on my side from here forward, I still don't want them to kill anybody. This lab doesn't really seem all of that all that forgotten to me. Looks like this would have been a way of sneaking past all of the guards and such if I had felt like doing so. But then there's also another way of getting around here. Up on this loud ass ventilation duct. 
And that's just sneaking through this door. I appreciate a lady who appreciates value. Jesus is ripe in here. Say, somebody, uh, fetch me a millionaire to clean this mess up. Sure there's a lot of people in this room. Alright, looks like we've finally gotten into the laboratory area of things. And you know, that mic that golden microscope is giving me the four flashbacks. Comstock promises there's nothing to be worried about. But I don't like the smell of things down in Finkton. Not one bit. If trouble rears its ugly head in the form of one cantankerous negress, I've laid in some supplies in the event of a forced evacuation. They're down in what I call my chamber of panic, near the base of my statue. I've set the code to 8371. Well, that'll be a number to keep track of. Gotta love how the people you knock out snore. Because that's what they're doing. They're sleeping. I, I guess they were exhausted before you conked them in the noggin. That's why they would go straight from a semi-unconscious state directly into full unconsciousness. Don't I think heard you, you can hide from me. Ah, crap. Well, maybe this will work out for the best. I can do my old counting game. Assuming they make it all the way up here, that is. That, uh... May not be guaranteed. Okay, so here's someone. Oh. Here I come. One. Now, let's see if anybody else can follow. I'll find her. At least they're keeping up a good pace. They might actually reach this staircase this time. Don't think you can hide from me. Or they might all collect at the wrong end of the uh, second floor walkway. Gonna hunt you down. Is that guy still persistent? Oh. I ain't no problem. Else can find. Oh, spoke too soon. Man, it would just be so easy if they all lined up to get hit, like last time. I mean, that could still happen, mind you. Well, it looks like it's going to take a little more time to uh, get that going. Ah, oh, damn it! Here I come! Man, how did that guy still know where I was when I turned invisible? You can't hide forever. Like, normally, that's enough to throw them off when you ter literally turn invisible. Who did this? I guess not this time. Alright, guess she's the only persistent one at this point. So, uh... There we go. Who else we got? Looks like we're... Running low on people in this room. That's good. Yeah, we'll be going into the handyman operating wing later. So for right now, just need to take care of the people who are already in this room. Yeah, 
you can pickpocket people. That's nice. This guy's probably going to see the body. Or maybe not. Maybe I could just do that. Now, what about this last guy here? Got some pretty heavy armor on him. Never seen her before. I'll find her. Well, maybe it's good that I attracted him to my location. See if I can conk them. Apparently, I can't. At least not when they're aware. Daisy sacrificed herself. Set me up to kill her. To, to turn me in. To turn me into what? A killer. Yeah, well, mission accomplished. I'm no martyr. How did you do it, Booker? How did you... Elizabeth, I'm not Booker. And neither am I. What the heck? Where did she come from? But, yeah, I, I don't think they needed to... My point is that I don't think they needed to engineer this whole scenario just so that... Elizabeth kills one person. I mean, opening all the doors would be traumatic enough to cause her to consider killing someone. I really think that's true. She would have seen through all the doors, seen all the versions of her who had killed, who had chosen to do that. Where is this person going? So... With this latest update, we have taken a big step away from a multiverse setting in favor of a time travel setting with a multiversal set dressing. For this reason, I think we should head back to Literature Corner so that I can discuss in detail how exactly literary time travel works and why I'm rather bothered by how Bioshock Infinite is not living up to the rules it has set for itself. Now let's go through things one category at a time. The Visitor Out of Time model. This is essentially the original version of the time travel story, as it describes the pioneering works of Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court and H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. Essentially, this model has no real changes to the timeline, or whatever changes occur are reversed without any further time travel intervention, and as such, the story is more about observing an unusual setting, past or future. Or it's about the fish-out-of-water antics of one or more characters who don't belong. The Time Machine is about a man who goes 800,000 years into the future and discovers that the human race has diverged into two distinct species. The Eloi, a race of beautiful and fun-loving creatures who also happen to be mostly unintelligent, and the Morlocks, an ugly and physically degenerated race which lives underground and yet maintains enough intelligence to treat the Eloi as livestock. The Morlocks are descended from the lower classes and the Eloi from the upper classes, making the book a satire of modern life. And that's not just an allegorical analysis. The book is very direct about explaining this. By contrast, Connecticut Yankee is about a man, Hank, who comes from that particular state and mysteriously finds himself transported back to a fictional time and place, King Arthur's Court. Although he's at first sentenced to burn at the stake, he correctly predicts an eclipse and uses his knowledge of future science and technology to position himself as a court magician. Quite naturally, Merlin attempts to stop him but his reliance on actual magic proves to be entirely useless against Hank's real science. Gradually, Hank basically takes over England by revolutionizing both technology and the social infrastructure, and is only stopped when the Catholic Church shows up with an army and battles him and his supporters into a corner. Because of this, everyone who knows the secrets of the future die from the war, 
or from the disease which follows, and Hank himself is put to sleep for 1300 years by the only real spell Merlin manages to cast. Nothing about the world changes, but readers do get to enjoy one of the first works to clearly point out just how stupid it really is to admire chivalry or any other part of the Middle Ages. The Time Inertia Model This is more or less the default model when it comes to time travel stories, because it's the model you'll end up with if you don't think too hard about time travel would really work. Basically, the idea is that, for whatever reason, any and all time periods involved in the story continue to advance chronologically, despite the fact that, realistically, someone with a time machine could conceivably go back to the moment he or she left, so that no time will have passed between leaving and returning. Additionally, or alternately, a change made in a past time frame doesn't necessarily change the future, or at least it doesn't right away. And let me just note that this is in addition to any immunity to timeline changes held by the time travelers themselves. Such an immunity is pretty much required for a variety of time travel settings, since the protagonist would be unable to function otherwise. The reason why an author would choose this model is because it carries with it the traditional stakes of timely action and singular chances which you find in, you know, an ordinary chronological universe. This means that the story is comparably easy to write, since you don't have to account for differences brought on by time travel, and it means that the audience can engage with the story since the conflict is clear and easy to grasp. On the other hand, this model can be a problem because from what we can tell, time doesn't have inertia. And when you think about all the time that has to pass for one time frame to become another, it's hard to imagine that the future wouldn't have changed by then. As such, this model either needs a lot of excuses or it needs to be entirely shameless about its complete physical impossibility, and if it can't do either, it's going to make no sense whatsoever. An example of the time inertia model would be the Back to the Future series. Although there's no simultaneity between 1985 and 1955, Marty McFly doesn't wink out of existence the moment he changes history and accidentally makes his mother fall for him instead of his father. Instead, the changes slowly ripple down the time stream, wiping out his older siblings first as the ripples reach their birth dates, and only reaching his at the end of the movie. Similarly, when Biff changes history in the second movie, 2015 was still the same when he got back, but 1985 was different by the time Marty leaves. As for not overusing the time machine, the films handle this problem by having the DeLorean's flux capacitor be inoperable for one reason or another throughout most of each film's length. The Butterfly Effect Model This one is simple to define. Actions in the time stream have consequences, immediate consequences, and whatever a time traveler does can lead to positive or to entirely unexpected negative consequences. This is another one of the more predominant time travel models because it allows the protagonists to have some agency in the story, and it gives the writer the chance to show how our actions can sometimes lead to unpredictable results. There's a lot of overlap with the time inertia model, of course, but the big difference is that all changes have instant consequences, and only a select few have any idea that anything has changed. Of course, there's one big problem with this kind of time travel, the grandfather paradox. If you were to, for instance, go into the past and kill one of your grandfathers before he has the chance to give birth to your mother or father, then you won't exist. But if you don't exist, then obviously you don't have the capacity to kill your grandfather, who will thus live and pass his genes on down to you, who will use them to go on and kill your grandfather, etc, etc. It is a complete impossibility which butterfly effect time travel appears to make possible. And the paradox extends beyond obvious cases too. If someone goes into the past and changes something, 
And if you go into the past to change it back, then if nothing changed, why did you go back to change things? The usual sweep it under the rug explanation is that, once again, time travelers are somehow immune to the effects of changing reality and can thus maintain their motivations no matter what else happens around them. This is basically how it works in the old TV show Quantum Leap, which featured Sam and Al jumping back to various points during Sam's lifetime and doing their best to make the world a better place. The Static Time Model The Static Time Model is the exact opposite of the Butterfly Effect Model. While in the latter model just about anything you do may change the path of history forever, in the Static Time Model everything you do has already happened, and thus will happen, when you go back in time to enact it. This avoids the grandfather paradox by saying that your grandfather lived because his history happened and he lived, but it does bring up a second paradox, the ontological paradox. Basically, if there's a closed time loop that eventually sets itself into motion, then where do the original ideas and artifacts involved come from? Any attempt to trace back an idea goes into a loop with no origin point, and therefore it cannot exist. With artifacts, it's even worse, because anything that gets brought back in time to become its own origin will wind up going through history an infinite number of times in every instant, and should therefore turn to dust or explode as the very protons and neutrons it's composed of reach their incredibly long half-lives and break apart. Fortunately, it's easy enough to beat this paradox by making sure that everything involved has a unique origin point outside of the loop, but that doesn't always happen. You also have to deal with the fact that a closed time loop has no real conflict. You know how things are going to turn out because you've seen the consequences. As such, the story needs to compensate for this fact either by waiting until the end to reveal the fact that time is unchangeable, or else by having the primary conflict take place in the last of the time frames. Alternately, a story can base the conflict around the internal conflict of having to accept that time cannot change, or it can use a variation on the time inertia model, which essentially says that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And so even if you do change things, history will unfold more or less the same. You could still shift this model to a butterfly effect variation, but it would take a lot of effort to do so. In the film Twelve Monkeys, Bruce Willis travels back in time to gather information about a viral outbreak that wiped out most of humanity. At several points he tries to foil what he believes to be the plot to unleash this virus, but ultimately he fails. Why did he fail? Because he did fail. Because the outbreak did happen and led to him going back in time. But since time travel is experimental in this setting, Willis's character doesn't know that fact for certain until the end, when he fails for the final time. The Time Loop Model In this model, the plot centers around a single repeating time loop. Basically, after a set amount of time passes, everything resets and returns to a specific starting point. Typically, there are only a few people who realize this loop is happening, maybe even just one person, and it's up to the people who are aware to either figure out what's going on and fix the problem, or to take advantage of having an effectively infinite span of time in order to grow, to learn, to create the most perfect day possible. There are no real paradoxes involved, aside from the fact that you have to stretch pretty far if you want to try and explain what's going on. As far as examples go, I could probably have named this the Groundhog Day model and most of you would have gotten what I meant. The movie Groundhog Day is about a weatherman played by Bill Murray who has to relive a terrible day over and over again until he finally turns it into the best day of his life. And something I definitely liked about this movie is the fact that it never bothers to explain why this is happening to it. 
Like I've said before, the reasoning behind the rules isn't as important as the rules themselves. And the audience cares more that they're consistent than that they make sense in terms of our reality. And so that's what Groundhog Day does. It shows us the rules, it shows us the limitations of what's going on and the way the characters change and stay the same as Murray's character does things differently, and in the end, it rewards his hard work by letting him see February 3rd. The Multiverse Model This model actually isn't all that common. I've mentioned before that authors have trouble when it comes to grappling with the lack of limitations associated with infinite universes. And those issues are still present when you're using them as an excuse to apparently travel through time. But at the same time, it allows time travelers to make permanent changes without running afoul of the grandfather paradox. But on the other hand, by bringing infinity into the mix, it means that these changes don't necessarily count. Because while you may be improving a similar alternate universe, you aren't actually fixing your own. Dragon Ball Z, of all shows, is probably the best example of this model. A character named Trunks does the Terminator thing, where he goes back in time to warn the heroes of androids that will appear in three years and destroy civilization, and he explains that the main protagonist, Goku, won't be around to save the day because he'll be dead of heart disease by then. He then hands Goku some medicine, and then hops back into his time machine so that he'll be around to help when the androids appear. However, things do not go entirely according to his predictions. For one thing, Goku has his heart attack years after it should have happened, and the first androids who appear aren't the right ones. Eventually, Trunks realizes that he hasn't traveled through time, but through dimensions. Hence the discrepancies. And so we come to the troubles that Bioshock Infinite is having with its use of time travel. It's trying to use its multiverse model to invoke multiple other models, apparently unaware that the multiverse counts as its own thing. It starts out using the multiverse correctly as bookers from an infinite number of parallel realities go to Columbia to try and rescue Elizabeth, and then Elizabeth uses her ability to shift reality to jump into new universes where past actions are different. But as they attempt to enter Comstock House, the game switches to a butterfly effect model as future Elizabeth contacts a booker from her apparent past to fix what once went wrong. Even though she could have, for instance, contacted an alternate version of herself directly and passed on the critical information at an earlier point in her own timeline. And now, in Burial at Sea, we've moved on to a static time model where present Elizabeth didn't encounter past Elizabeth and Booker because she didn't encounter them. In a multiverse model, she could totally change her past because that's not actually her. But the game says she doesn't because she didn't. And that's not how it's supposed to work. A multiverse model can't support the idea that one universe is more real or important than all the rest. There's the one we spend the most time in, but that's not the same thing. And even if BSI wants that to be true, its story contradicts that conclusion. The Booker universe, the one with the Booker who trades away his daughter Anna, has to be on equal footing with the Comstock universe for the premise to make any sense because that's the one Elizabeth is from. And the Rapture universe is obviously just as real, considering that it has its own mostly separate story. So that's why I dislike the way Bioshock Infinite uses its setting. Sure, it can excuse itself by claiming infinite universes, and we don't understand how things would really work under these conditions, but as I've said, the explanations aren't what's important. All Bioshock Infinite had to do was invent a set of rules, communicate these rules to the audience, and then avoid breaking them as much as possible. And so far as my experience with BSI goes, it has failed to accomplish this. Thanks for joining me again in Literature Corner, and I hope I'll see you soon.